everyone. I'm excited to bring to you today Anna Lemke. And just by way of introduction, uh, Anna Lemke, MD, is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine. She is medical director of Stanford Addiction Medicine, program director for the Stanford Addiction Medicine Fellowship, and chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. Dr. Lemke received her BA in Humanities from Yale University and her MD from Stanford University, where she also completed her residency in psychiatry and fellowship in mood disorders. She is a diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and of the American Board of Addiction Medicine. Dr. Lemke has developed multiple teaching programs on drug misuse and addiction therapy. She has held multiple leadership and mentorship positions and received the Stanford's Chairman's Award for Clinical Innovation and the Stanford Departmental Award for Outstanding Teaching. She is also author of Drug Dealer MD, How Doctors Were Duped, Patients Got Hooked, and Why It's So Hard to Stop, Johns Hopkins University Press, um, highlighted in the New York Times as one of the top five books to read to understand the opioid epidemic. So um, welcome, Dr. Lemke. Thank you well, so thank much. thank you. Hi, yeah, thanks so much for, for doing this. Um, you know, you've actually been in a lot of interviews. Um, I've, I've watched many of them. Um, and a lot of them were initially, uh, it seems like, centered on the opioid epidemic. And Recently, though, you have been speaking out about benzodiazepines. You recently did the, the Lisa Ling interview on CNN. And, and of course, um, you are an advisor to the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices. And so I just wanted to start off by asking you what motivated you or inspired you to start focusing your attention on the benzodiazepine problem? Well, for, first of all, thank you for watching um, so many of my interviews. Um, and also thank you for your work and your advocacy in this space. Um, in fact, you know, I have been um, focused on the problem of benzodiazepines for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. My book, which was published in 2016 called Drug Dealer MD, uh, is often talked about as a book on the opioid crisis, but in fact, I meant it as a book on the problem of prescription drug uh, overprescribing more generally. And I do talk about the benzodiazepine problem uh, in my book. But interestingly, um, at that time, uh, the public and the media in particular uh, were very focused only on opioids. So it's not so much that my work has shifted as much as that the, the attention of the general public has shifted. And I, I credit that shift in attention largely to organizations like the Benzodiazepine Alliance, giving uh, people who uh, have been, you know, um, harmed by benzodiazepine prescribing uh, a voice and also a network and emboldening them to contact journalists to tell their stories, which then led those journalists back to me uh, sometimes uh, to talk about the benzo problem. So it's been interesting for me to see that evolution through time, um, how initially that focus on opioids was very exclusive, uh, but the grassroots advocacy uh, from patients and victims of benzodiazepines sort of demanded that the media also focus on benzodiazepines. And so then there was a renewed interest in my work um, because of uh, that grassroots advocacy. So that's a long, it's a long-winded way of answering your <laughs> question. Um, you know, as a psychiatrist, I, I've 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 been long um, troubled by and also uh, working on the problem of psychotropic overprescribing. So not just opioids, not just benzodiazepines, but also antidepressants, antipsychotics. These are all medications that um, I myself prescribe. And I think they have real utility and usefulness when used properly. But I also uh, believe uh, that they're overprescribed and utilized in populations uh, when they shouldn't be. Um, and that when we use them at high doses long term, we, we can do a lot of harm. So um, my, the, the space of my work has been that broad for some time. That's really great to hear. Um, because and and on, on the one hand, you know the opioid 
opioid, opiate, I never know which word is better to use in this situation, but um, that epidemic uh, was beneficial for those of us who have been involved in, in benzodiazepine activism because it was really hard to get any attention on these right. drugs because nobody really cares. Um, benzodiazepines are super hard to overdose on, so you don't have a lot of necessarily, uh, comparatively speaking, benzodiazepine overdose deaths. But obviously, in combination um, with opiates, it's a huge problem. And then, plus, these drugs have just been around for so long. And quite frankly, so many people take them. Um, and, and I'd like to get into that a, a bit more with you, uh, um, you know, just that there are so many people who take these. They're not abusing them. They're just taking them long term. And that that's kind of where a big part of the problem lies. And I know you um, basically, so you deal a lot with patients who are um, what over medicated or who, who you do also deal with people who are dealing with addiction and helping them to get off of these right and and I'm I'm wondering um, it's something that I see a lot like just comments and stuff on, on my channel or, or you know in, in interacting with people who are on benzodiazepines is um, a lot of them say I I love my benzodiazepine I would die if I didn't have it <laughs> um, and I've been taking it forever and I'm fine and while I, I just want to act, preface this by saying, I don't think anybody should ever be forced off their benzodiazepine. I think that that's some of the worst cases that I, that I see are people who are forced off, who aren't ready to get off, and they've been on these for 15, 20 years. Um, a lot of these people, I see the, just kind of the tone and the way that they're talking. I think they're probably not that objective about how the benzodiazepine is working for them or what it's really doing uh, for their lives. And um, that I'm wondering, have you seen this or what's your opinion on that? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the, the really um, baffling things about these drugs is that it's very hard to see cause and effect when you're taking them. It can feel subjectively like they're helping with anxiety, insomnia on any number of symptoms uh, when in fact they may actually be exacerbating the problem. And the reason for that is because they do hijack these reward systems in the brain separate from the, the regions of the brain that may be related to anxiety specifically or sleep specifically. So that you know we do have the feeling when we take them that they're relieving a psychiatric symptom when in fact really we've um, you know gotten ourselves in this cycle of dependency and withdrawal and we're really medicating withdrawal from the last dose. So when I'm working with patients, one of the main um, you know important sort of teaching points that I try to make, especially as we engage in the taper, is that their anxiety and their insomnia, depression, irritability, it will all get worse when we first go down on the dose. But that's not necessarily the, the level of anxiety that they'll have to live with. That's uh, anxiety withdrawal mediated. Uh, so it's withdrawal mediated anxiety. And that if they can just uh, hang in there long enough for the brain to reset itself, uh, what they'll find is that they'll eventually go back to their baseline or they may even find that their anxiety is improved. Um, so it's, it's a really tricky thing, you know, kind of linking cause and effect and what feels like the cause may in fact be the effect. Yeah, that is so tricky. And I've been there myself. I was prescribed them for sleep. And when I would try and cut back even just a small amount, I would just be so bad. And I thought, oh, this is because of the insomnia. I'm, I'm you know, I can't function because of the insomnia. Looking back now, I realize, oh, I wasn't functioning because I had to, I had like all these severe with withdrawal symptoms, a lot of them were cognitive, and I didn't know that's what they were. And so I just had to keep taking it because I didn't know how to get off of it. Um, now you, I, I know you have a lot of experience in also helping people get off of benzos and opiates, I'm assuming. Um, so I guess I kind of have two questions for you in that. Uh, what does it look like when you help somebody get off of a benzodiazepine and are they very different from the people um, who are trying to get off of opiates what's the difference that you have noticed in your practice there's a lot more similarity than than difference the dependence phenomenon that people develop on opioids 
is as severe as it is uh, on benzodiazepines uh, for some patients. And the process of getting off is very similar to what Heather Ashton recommends in the Ashton Manual. In fact, she's one of my medical heroes because you know a good 15 years ago, I was encountering patients who needed help getting off of benzodiazepines and I had received no training in medical school on how to do that. And it really was her work uh, that provided the framework for me to begin to work with these patients, especially her admonishment to go slowly, uh, to enlist the patient in that process, uh, to take breaks, but to never go backwards. And in fact, so instrumental has her teaching and guidance been on, on the way that I practice, that when I got involved with trying to create opioid tapering guidelines, they really were founded on Heather Ashton's benzodiazepine tapering guidelines, almost all of those principles. Um, we've now incorporated in national guidelines to help people taper down on their opioids. So, so there's more similarity than differences. And again, I just a big shout out to Heather Ashlin, Ashton, who you know died recently, but who was really a giant um, in the field. And I think her genius really was that she listened to her patients. Uh, she didn't um, disregard or minimize their experiences. She didn't uh, say that it was impossible that they should be experiencing such severe withdrawal. She, she acknowledged that there are some patients who become extremely dependent on these drugs, who have enormous difficulty tapering off of them or even to, to lower doses. And then she uh, worked with them very specifically and created, as you know, uh, tapering guidelines based on the real life experience of her patients. I think that's what's so rich about her work is that it wasn't like a placebo controlled trial or generic guidelines. She really said, this is Mr. Smith and this is how Mr. Smith and I worked together to get off of you know, Xanax. And so those um, taper schedules you know, that, she, that are available online are somehow that, that the texture of that real life example is very, very powerful. And so, um, again, as we're trying to create opioid tapering guidelines, we're trying to uh, follow in her footsteps. Yeah, and that's why um, I I created this whole Ashton Manual just video series, just kind of Great. Uh, broken down and explaining it because, like like you said, her work it still stands today. It was done so long ago. It's unfortunately not as well known as it should be by the medical profession in general for uh, withdrawal, but um, it can be difficult a lot of times for patients to, to understand all of that, um, especially when you're dealing with a, a benzodiazepine injury. It's really a, a brain injury in a lot of ways and you have difficulty processing all these things. So um, if you don't have a doctor who, like yourself who can kind of help somebody go through that, it can, be, it can be kind of daunting or overwhelming, but I'm just so glad to hear that you apply that. And I'm assuming you apply that too to withdrawal from other psychiatric drugs too, right? Not just benzodiazepines, because those can be brutal as well to get off of. Yeah, so that's something else that I learned from my patients over the years is that um, not all, but a subset of patients have great difficulty getting off other psychiatric medications like antidepressants, mood stabilizers, and antipsychotics. So in general, um, we try to go very slowly, see how patients tolerate it, and depending on how they tolerate it, we let that, that inform uh, how we proceed. Do you utilize other psychiatric drugs in helping patients get off of other psychiatric drugs like benzodiazepines or what, what kind of, um, I don't know, caution do you use in, in doing that? Yeah, that's a great question um, because, um, every, you know, it's, it's very frequent that patients um, ask if there's another drug or medication that will help them get off of their benzodiazepine or their opioid. And what I tell them is um, we can use um, non-addictive medications to sort of help as nudges, but that there's nothing that we can give them that will feel like it works as well as their benzodiazepine or their opioid. And that indeed what they're in for is a very hard journey. So I really like to set expectations and let patients know that what, what they're about to do and what I'm asking them to do in the course of a taper is, is actually painful and hard and that 
um, it will take sort of all of their grit um, and their patience to get through it. Having said that, we do use non-addictive sleep aids. Um, sometimes we use uh, the medications in the anti-seizure of family, anti-epileptic medications to help people get off of benzodiazepines. Um, sometimes we, uh, you know, use things that sort of calm down the autonomic system. Um, but it's, it's tricky because, for example, um, gabapentin, Neurontin was a medication that I used to prescribe uh, frequently as a non-addictive alternative, only to discover that some of my patients uh, actually found it also potentially addictive. Some of my patients became dependent on it, experienced significant withdrawal coming off. I have had one patient in particular who once she was on uh, Neurontin, it took her about a year and a half to get off of it. She had a terrible Neurontin withdrawal. I've also had patients who misuse Neurontin, get addicted. So it's really, it's hard because, you know, you, you wish, we wish there was something kind of magical that could, you know, ease the process. But, um, and, I, and again, importantly, I do use other medications, but I try to use them sparingly and I try to make sure that patients uh, know that if, for example, we're using an anti-seizure medication to help them get off of benzodiazepine, that then we're going to have to taper the anti-seizure medication. Sometimes it's worth it because that's just kind of a stepping stone that makes it um, possible for patients to get off of benzos where they otherwise might not be able to. Uh, but it, it's it's a long haul. Yeah. I will add I will add as one caveat. You know, there has been a lot of um, sort of talk about using cannabis in particular to help people get off of opioids. And the data are showing that that's not a good strategy. Uh, what ends up happening is that people don't actually get off their opioids, but they get onto cannabis. The result is that they're on both opioids and cannabis. Um, anecdotally, in my clinical experience, I have actually seen some people use cannabis uh, to lower their opioid dose but the, the cannabis inevitably becomes its own substitution problem. Yeah, it's interesting. It's really interesting to hear your experience sort of confirm my own with the people. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I don't like give medical advice, but I have a lot of people that I interact with online and, and they'll ask me and I'll say, well, this is what I've seen. This is generally what's done. Um, and, and yeah, everything you're saying is true. Sometimes meds work for some people. Sometimes it's just adding fuel to the fire and now they got to taper that. Uh, with benzodiazepines, there are a lot of people who it does seem to ease their their passage off of the drug. Some it doesn't do anything for. I don't follow up though long term. I don't know. Okay, where are they a year from now? Are they still, <laughs> you know, are they still like using cannabis successfully or or off or what? So, yeah, I guess time will tell as far as that goes. But yeah, I, I, um, I I also also just want to add that you know. As much as I'm a proponent of um, not over-prescribing benzodiazepines, and as much as I'm a proponent of helping people get off, about 50% of my clinic now is a de-prescribing clinic for people who are dependent. I also think that there are some people who are, by virtue of medical comorbidity, med medical frailty, or other circumstances, may in the process of tapering get to a dose where it's just not worth it to get all the way off, and maybe really the best thing for them is to just stay at that lower dose as a kind of a harm reduction strategy. Yeah, that's, that sounds, again, true to what I have seen as well. It's just, I don't know, there's just a certain level of injury that happens, I think that's irreversible, or I hate to say irreversible because I think everybody can heal to a certain extent, but it's definitely pretty, it's brutal. It can be brutal. And I think it just depends on a person's situation. Can they handle attempting to heal from that level of injury for the next couple of years or whatever it may take uh, and being that incapacitated? Um, so, you know, why are so many people um, on these meds? I actually... I have your book. I do have it. I haven't actually read the whole thing. I have a good excuse for that. But as you can see, I've taken some notes and things here. Um, mainly, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. It's because I have a hard time with the A word. Because oh. addiction is, is just, uh, it's it, not that I have any sort of um, discrimination towards people who are dealing with addiction. But when it comes to the benzodiazepine problem, the vast majority of people who are having problems getting off their benzodiazepine are not dealing with addiction. They're taking these things as prescribed, they're taking them in, in low doses, and they, it's just, 
it's a completely different problem and seeing um, addiction being thrown into the mix and people being mis misdiagnosed or mistreated or whatever because medical professionals or loved ones think it's addiction it's just it's, it's so difficult so I, I have to kind of you know <laughs> avoid that language and it's hard for me sometimes to uh, look at it you know when that when the word addiction is used but there's a lot of good information in here and I, I was thinking maybe you could just kind of help us to understand because um, it says drug dealer MD and that's that's pretty harsh language are you saying that doctors are drug dealers or um, you know what are you what are you saying in this book about that well I um, I I agree with you the the title is a little harsh but I think the subtitle is important it does say how doctors were duped patients got hooked and why it's so so hard to stop I really see doctors in many ways as much the victims of this problem as, as patients themselves in the sense that most doctors do go into medicine to try to save lives and alleviate suffering and I think get, get poor education around the problems of dependence and addiction, um, are not taught how to use opioids and benzodiazepines judiciously, um, get no training in how to get patients off of them particularly patients who have become dependent. Um, and then furthermore, there are a lot of incentives inside of medicine that encourage doctors to prescribe pills instead of using other interventions for anxiety, insomnia, pain, what have you. Uh, so I, I, what I was really trying to unpack there is why is it that um, you know, a basically good person, educated at a good school, Who's, who's gone into medicine to do good work and help people, ends up unwittingly harming them. And so I try to kind of go through uh, the influence of the pharmaceutical industry, but also again, all of these invisible incentives inside of medicine, uh, patient rating satisfaction surveys, um, the incredible pressure on doctors to see more patients in shorter amounts of time to get them in and out quickly patient demand for pills, for specific pills to alleviate their anxiety um, because patients themselves underestimate the risks. So th those are the types of things I try to try to capture and explain. Um, yeah, and again, it's my experience, you know, it, when I was trying to get off of, of a benzodiazepine and I had found Professor Ashton's work and I was, um, I remember presenting that to one doctor and he he was very antagonistic, you know. He's like, mm -hmm. "Oh, that's pseudoscience," and and if you know you're so smart, what do you need us doctors for? And and then at other times I'd go in, you know, I, I was trying to find a doctor anywhere who who knew how to help me with this, and it was just like, "Well, do you have a history of mental illness? Do you have a history of addiction?" It's like, no, this really is this really mm -hmm. is just benzodiazepine withdrawal from. A, a low dose of, of Ativan. Um, so is there any sort of, I don't know, I guess, a, I mean, obviously in the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate doctors about this, but it's kind of like you brought up a couple of times, it's kind of after the fact, after you've graduated, after you've learned how to practice medicine and you're already kind of doing it and now, oops, uh, we forgot you didn't learn this. Right. Um, what, I don't know, is there any way to sort of um, preempt this and educate doctors before they even start prescribing benzodiazepines? Well, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head. That's really what we need to do. We need to go way upstream with this problem and get, you know, medical students and NP students and MA students early in their training and do a much better job educating them about the risks of benzodiazepines. Um, we also need to ed educate them about the evidence, what the evidence actually shows, which is that benzodiazepines are effective short term, but there's no evidence to show benefit when used long term, even though that's how we tend to prescribe them. Um, these are all facts that are unknown to the vast majority of healthcare providers who wildly, wild, wildly underestimate uh, the risks as well as the dependence slash addictive potential of benzodiazepines. So I do think that a wholesale paradigm shift in our medical education um, that puts safe prescribing at the forefront, as well as uh, the dangers of polypharmacy using multiple drugs simultaneously in one patient 
and the importance of knowing how to safely and compassionately de-prescribe are key elements that are missing from medical education that, that need to uh, be there. How to make that happen, that's a great question. <laughs> I think grassroots awareness is key. There are some other simpler policy levers. For example, medical students will study to the test. So right now there are very few, if any, uh, questions on uh, medical graduation exams or board exam, board certification exams on addiction, on dependence, on the risks of benzodiazepines. So if we get some more of those questions uh, into uh, certification exams, that will make a difference and raise awareness. Um, you know, the continuing medical education circuit after doctors are out in practice. I've been doing a lot of, spending a lot of my time going around trying to educate doctors. It's been really interesting because now the message about the dangers of opioids and opioid tapering among primary care doctors and pain physicians is widely known. But if I walk into a room for, full of psychiatrists and try to talk about the risks of benzodiazepines, people look at me like, you know, I just landed from Mars. <laughs> so it's really interesting how there's just this gap. And um, psychiatrists, you know, are really also lacking in important and fundamental knowledge about benzodiazepines. And we need to, we definitely need to remedy that. Yeah, and, and we're working on it, I guess, uh, as much as we can. I mean, that's why you're here, and uh, I appreciate you <laughs> doing this doing this, and being a part of this. Um, is there anything else that if you could speak to patients or doctors um, with regard to benzodiazepines um, that you would just like to get out there as a message? Well, I, you know, I've gotten a lot of calls from people all over the country who are um, kind of doing it on their own as, as you had to do, which makes me really sad because it's a hard thing to do. It takes time and effort and requires emotional support. And so a lot of people, um, you know, including other physicians, I've gotten lots of calls from other physicians who have become dependent mm -hmm. on benzodiazepines and, and have a lot of shame about that, um, along with the physical problems and yet have really nowhere to turn. So, um, you know, when thinking about what patients as advocates can do, I just, I really urge people who want to get off of benzodiazepines or want to get to a lower dose to not be afraid to be the person who educates their own physicians. Um, the way that you tried to do by bringing in the, the Ashton Manual, unfortunately, you, you know, you didn't get a good reception, but I do believe that there are doctors out there who would welcome that information and that knowledge and appreciate being educated in that way. And so I really do believe that one patient, you know, educating her doctor might be the chain reaction for that doctor to then change their practice, to uh, educate other doctors, to educate medical students. So I guess that's that, you know, um, that's what I would say. Okay. Well, thank you um, so much for coming and doing this interview today. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I picked your brain as much as possible because you, you've, you're you so, um, I guess, prominent in this field, you know, and you've done um, so much good work out there. And I'm just really excited to uh, be a part of this alliance with you and all the other wonderful professionals you know, who are, are out there doing these continuing medical education courses, um, getting the information out there. Um, so I just really appreciate your time today and thanks for doing this interview. Um, before we finish up, I have one question for you that I kind of like to throw out at everybody, which is, is there anything that, or what is it that gives you hope when it comes to this whole situation when you see patients going through all the, these horrible withdrawals and the over prescribing what gives you hope when it comes to all of this well in my clinical work uh, one of my very favorite things um, that i do is when i get people off of um, benzodiazepines or other medications that i think are harming them and i see how they blossom and how their lives get so much better uh, it's just that never ever gets old and that that keeps me going and excited to go to work and uh, there's just something really empowering uh, for people to get off of a medication and realize that not only that can they 
uh, can they handle being off, but they actually feel better and that they can, um, you know, go on with their lives and do a lot of things that they weren't able to do while they were debilitated by the medications. That's so true. And even though I was still very sick, when I finished my taper, um, just the liberation of not having to go and refill that yeah. prescription every yeah. month. So I'd have to worry about being without and going to the ER, having a seizure. It's just so yeah. liberating. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My, my goal in life is to no longer be necessary to patients. That, <laughs> that, that means I, I've done my job when yeah. you know, don't That's, need it anymore. Yeah, that's a great goal. Healing is, is a good goal, I think, for anybody in the medical profession. Right. 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 Well, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Anna. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. And I really think a lot of people are going to benefit from our conversation. Um, so, you know, there may be a, a life or two out there that will be saved. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.